On this episode of Skeptico, Alex talks with the neurophilosophy pioneer, Dr. Patricia Churchland, about the implications of near-death experience science on neurophilosophy. Well, specifically, Dr. Churchland, you cite in your book that Dr. Pin von Lommel holds that opinion. That's clearly not the case. I mean, he's written... I see. Mm-hmm. You're right. You want me to read you what he's written? He's written that the study of patients with near-death experience, and this is from the Lancet paper that you're citing, clearly shows us that... Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and for this episode of Skeptico, I almost feel like I need to issue one of those warnings that they put on the front of shows that have content that might be inappropriate for some viewers. You know, I'm always surprised when people are squeamish over confrontation, conflict, debate uh, of any sort. I mean, I, I get that on one level. You know, we don't want to see people squirm and we want everyone to be nice to each other and all that. And I, I get that. But on another level, I, I want you to consider in this interview with Dr. Patricia Churchland, who I've really been trying to contact for years. I have emails going back several years ago trying to contact this woman who is a well-respected academic Oxford educated, UCSD, which is a prestigious university out here in California, uh, highly regarded at these conferences, gives these speeches, and has blabbed about these ridiculous ideas about consciousness that she has. She's blabbed about it for years. How else would one confront her on the nonsense that she talks about? I mean, how do you do that in a in a nice way? How do you do that in a non-confrontational way? I don't know that you can. So it really surprised me the extent to which she kind of breaks down and squirms and just kind of goes out in the outer limits of reality and believability in this interview. But I don't really know how to approach these things any other way if you really want to get answers. So, with that said, here's my interview with Dr. Patricia Churchland. Today we welcome Dr. Patricia Churchland to Skeptico. Dr. Churchland is a professor of philosophy at the University of California, San Diego, and at the very prestigious Salk Institute, both of which are just a few miles from where I sit, which is kind of interesting. She's also a very highly regarded academic and best known for her pioneering work in the field of neurophilosophy, where she looks to interface between traditional philosophical questions and new developments in the science of neuroscience. She's the author of several books, including Touching a Nerve, The Self as Brain. Dr. Churchland, welcome to Skeptico. Thanks so much for joining me. Hey, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, you know, in addition to seeing some of your excellent YouTubes and other interviews that you've done out there, I did have a chance to dip into a couple of these books. And most recently, I was trying to dig into Touching a Nerve. Tell us about that. Uh, Who's it written for, first of all, and and what's the general thrust of it? Well, it's written for a, a very general audience. It was really provoked, I think, by um, my realization as I taught undergraduates that many, many people have a kind of ambivalence about uh, neuroscience. On the one hand, they find it fascinating. It teaches them something about themselves. It sometimes teaches them things that are very surprising. On the other hand, they, they think, oh, gosh, you know, but what if, I mean, if I'm only my brain, it, you know, isn't, doesn't that sort of freak you out? And I think... I think it's a very natural reaction, especially if one has thoughts about an afterlife and and so forth. And so I really wanted to address that kind of ambivalence, and I wanted to sort of explain how things look from my perspective. And 
um, why it is or how it is, perhaps I should say, that I feel very comfortable with my brain and with knowing that my perceptions, my consciousness, my beliefs, my desires, they really are a function of the physical brain that resides within my head. Yeah, great. And that's really kind of an interesting place to start this idea that consciousness is an illusion of a biological robot. Oh, I wouldn't say it's an illusion. It's not an illusion at all. I well, think this is the quote, of course, that's what Daniel Dennett said, right? Famously. Yeah, but that's not what I said. Okay, what do you what do you so it's not an illusion? What is it? Are, are we biological robots like Richard Dawkins thinks? I don't think Richard thinks that we're biological robots either. I mean, I think that um, what what I what does seem to be emerging from science is that consciousness, for example, is a property of the physical brain. It's one of the things, one of the many things, actually, that the physical brain does. And it changes when we fall asleep, it changes when we drink alcohol, it changes when we're tired or very hungry, and it changes also as a result of changes in hormones. And so if you think about your own puberty, for example, you will remember that as the levels of uh, sex hormones in your pituitary changed and it consequently as the levels of uh, sex hormones in your brain changed, you began to think about things in a rather different way and um, you began to notice certain kinds of things, to pay attention, to be fixated by certain kinds of things and so forth. And so we think that, that consciousness is a function of the physical brain. It's a very fascinating function. It's almost certainly not too uni unique to humans. Um, but but it is a very real property of the physical brain in just the way that eye movements or um, many other um, functions, memory, attention, um, problem solving, reasoning, self-control. These are all things that are properties of the physical brain. Yeah, but aren't we kind of trying to split hairs and kind of move away from the consciousness as an illusion thing without really jumping all the way to the other side of where the, the physicists are taking us and saying that consciousness is somehow fundamental. I mean, if we break down this debate on what is the nature of consciousness, we have these two camps that we've been talking about, I guess, talking around. One is this very materialistic view, like I think you started out, but then I don't know if you really were holding to that, that you know, consciousness is purely a result of an epiphenomena of the brain. It's no, it's not an epiphenomenon. It, it is an actual phenomenon of the physical brain. It's one of the things that the physical brain does. And just the way that your brain stores memories, and some of those memories change over time as a result of um, changes in the physical brain. And we know, for example, that people who have Alzheimer's, because they have lost, uh, many neurons in the phys in in their brains no longer have a capacity to remember certain things. Memory is a real function of the physical brain, and so is consciousness. It's not an illusion; it's the real deal. But it's the what is it? I mean, I think we're kind of dancing around. You're saying it's immaterial, or it is it is material, or it's immaterial. I mean, don't we need to nail it down a little bit more than that? You're saying it's. It, what's an emergent property of the brain? Isn't that kind of passing the buck a little bit? Here's the other possible explanation. Consciousness is somehow fundamental, and mm -hmm. that the brain is somehow interacting with this consciousness, which is a reality in somehow in the field of consciousness is out there, and the brain is somehow interacting with it. But that's not to confuse it with being purely a result of brain activity. I mean, mm -hmm. that is a completely different theory, right? It's a theory for which there's essentially no evidence. And one of the problems with that approach is that uh, we can't understand, for example, why taking a drug 
should change your consciousness if consciousness is not part of the physical brain because we know that the drug changes the physical brain and if consciousness is somehow uh, completely independent of that because it's a fundamental feature of the it universe. It has to be. It doesn't we, have to be completely independent. Obviously, there's some relationship, a very ah, close okay. relationship. Well, so. this is, of course, what what always puzzled Descartes is if there, if as he thought, there is an independent, non-physical soul. How does it interact with the physical brain? And the problem with dualism is that nobody has ever been able to address that in a meaningful, testable way. Yeah, but I think what we also have problems with the idea of this emergent property of the brain thing that we're kind of moving to, right? I mean, I interviewed Christoph Koch from Caltech uh, last year, and he's the guy who I really think set people down this direction that we can no longer claim that consciousness is a product of the brain, and we have to move towards this, what seems to me this kind of middle position where we're saying, what does he say, ontologically distinct but never really define how consciousness begins, how consciousness ends, exactly what the relationship is with the brain. I mean, I, aren't, I think a lot of people are more comfortable with Daniel Dennett, Richard Dawkins, okay, consciousness is an illusion, than they are with this middle ground that I, I don't really know how that answers the big questions of what is the nature of consciousness, other than just to repeat that consciousness is something that the brain does. I mean, that doesn't tell us much. What is, how does it begin? When does it end? What's necessary and sufficient to cause consciousness? These are all questions that are unanswered by what you're saying. Well, neuroscience hasn't got all the answers yet. We, there are many <laughs> things about... Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I mean, but that's just kind of passing the buck. We don't have the answers. Those are fundamental questions. If we don't have the answers, then we don't really have a theory of what consciousness is, right? That's what uh, your view seems to be, all right. Well, I'm just saying, I mean, these are basic. When does consciousness begin? When does it end? What is necessary and sufficient to create consciousness? If we can't answer those, then what, what do we really have? What can we really say about consciousness? Well, I guess we, uh, we can't say anything. Okay, well, I think we can say some things. I, I think we can say, well, let me <clears throat> ask you this. <laughs> I didn't mean to throw you completely off. You want to get back to talking about your book, maybe? No, not really. Okay. Um, let me ask you this, Dr. Churchland. Do you think consciousness can do work? Is that an important element to understanding what consciousness is? I mean, the theory before this is that consciousness can't really do anything. But have we come around. I think there's research that suggests that maybe consciousness can be focused, can direct, can affect neuroplasticity and other things. What's your feeling about that? Well, you seem to think that it does do work, so why don't we just go with that? So you agree it does do work? I have no opinion on the matter. Okay. What do you think about near-death experience? You write quite a bit about that in your book, and what is your general take on near-death experience? Um, well, I'm not sure that it really matters, does it? It doesn't. What does it matter? What does it matter for? Well, I, I think a lot of folks look at near-death experience as highly suggestive of consciousness somehow, in some way we don't understand, surviving biological death, which would certainly kind of falsify that other idea that it's so tied to the brain and that consciousness ends at death. I mean, that would falsify that, right? Oh, I'm sorry. There was, my dog just came in. Uh, no, 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 no. Don't do that. You can't. No, 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 no. Oh, dear me. I'm sorry. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess I've never had actually a near-death experience. Have no. you? No, but oh, I mean, okay. you write quite a bit about it in your book. Um, so why do you want me to talk about it? Well, I guess one of the things I did want to ask you is, in your book, you ask the question, is there a neurobiological explanation for near-death experience? And then you cite NDE researcher and a former guest on this show as answering that question with yes. And you say that Dr. Pin von Lommel, 
believes the answer is yes. Is that your understanding of his research? Well, I think there's certainly quite a bit of evidence that uh, at least some near-death experiences have a neurobiological basis. Of course, we can't be sure about all of them. Maybe you've had one that doesn't have a neurobiological basis. I wouldn't really know, would I? Well, specifically, Dr. Churchland, you cite in your book that Dr. Pin von Lommel holds that opinion. That's clearly not the case. I mean, he's written... I see. Mm -hmm. You're right. You want me to read you what he's written? He's written that the study of patients with near-death experience, and this is from the Lancet paper that you're citing, clearly shows us that... So that's it. She hung up on me. A first, really. Of all the interviews I've done, that's a first. Well, I immediately got an email, and I sent her this very short email. My email reads, wow, that's a first, smiley face. Is that really how you want to end things? I think you're going to look pretty bad. That's all I said. And I fully expected that that would be the end of it. I mean, come on, that was really testy. The tension was really thick. And I just thought I'd just never hear from her again. But to my surprise, she emailed me back a few minutes later. She writes, sorry, lost connection. I think my computer has a little problem. So sorry, Pat. So I immediately Skyped her again. Here's that call. Hello? Are we back? Uh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? You're coming through loud and clear. Oh, okay, great. Oops. Sorry, uh, my headset fell off. Yeah, okay, so what's up? Well, let's try and let's try and finish. I think it was getting a little bit testy there. I mean, tell me what your tell me what the what the rub is here. I'm telling you that you you totally distorted von Lommel's thing. It's right there in your book. It's I can give you the exact page. It's on page seventy one. You say there's a neurological explanation for NDEs. Is there? And then you cite Pin von Lommel as a NDE researcher who says there is. He clearly doesn't. He says the exact opposite. Hello? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what's, how do you explain that? Is it just a mistake or do you not know his research? I think or? that a lot of people do see that um, there are certain drugs and so forth that can cause out-of-body experiences or near-death near experiences. But Dr. Churchill, I'm talking about what you wrote in your book on page 71. You ask, you know, you say that this researcher, near-death experience researcher, claims that there's, that there's a neurological-based explanation for NDEs. That's not what he says. He says the opposite. Who else, what other NDE researchers do you know who support that, what you're saying? Do you know any who do? Hello? Dr. Churchland, are you there? <laughs> Hello. Oh, sorry. Is there? I, can you hear me? I'm here. I'm hear you now. I didn't hear anything before. There was just a long silence. Oh, I don't know what is going on. I don't know whether it's your computer or whether it's my computer or whether you're just messing with me or what's going on here. Um, but uh, this is not actually working out because um, I. You know, I Respond to things and you say you can't hear me, so I don't really know what to say. Well, no, please respond. I hear you fine. Now you're talking. I don't have any problem. <laughs> Do you want to write me an email response maybe to that to that question? I can I can do that. Okay, so now surely this is the end of this, right? I mean, it's just a charade at this point. If you listen at the very end, you hear her putting her 
coffee mug or whatever it is down on the table. You can hear the background noise and she's not talking into the microphone and claiming that there's these technical difficulties. So surely it's over now, right? Nope. Back to the email. A few minutes later, she writes, tried calling you, no answer. Maybe the problem is on your end. So I immediately emailed her back. No problem. Do you want to finish the interview? Question mark. So I called her for a third time. Here goes. Hello? Do you want me to try on a landline? Um, actually, my husband's on the landline, so that's not going to work. No, there's something, there's just something not working here. I just don't know quite what it is. Um, it so seems to be I, working fine now. Why don't you go ahead and give it a try now, whatever you want to say. Yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, And that was the end of it. I did send her another email asking her how she'd like to proceed, but I never heard back from her. Of course, I'd like to again thank Dr. Patricia Churchland for appearing on Skeptico, for agreeing to do the interview, and for pushing through all the technical problems we had. I'm sure it was a mistake on her part. These kind of people normally don't engage in any kind of debate or any kind of real substantial back and forth on these issues. I do have to say in my email, I told her exactly where I was coming from. I pointed to other interviews I've done. I think I pointed to the Christoph Koch interview and the Stuart Hameroff interview. Initially, when I contacted her years ago, she responded and said, you know, I don't really believe in Stuart Hameroff's ideas and therefore I don't want to talk about it. And I copied that original email when I followed up. So it's not like she didn't know where I was coming from. She just didn't focus on it. Otherwise, she, I think she would have been better prepared. But then again, I don't know how she could have prepared herself better because her ideas are ridiculous and her performance. I, I, I don't know. I'm going to be really interested to hear what you all have to say. It was stunning to me. It was laughable. In fact, I think you heard me laugh a couple of times. Here's a woman. I can hear the background noise, and yet she's suggesting that there's some kind of malfunction in the equipment and that that's the reason why she can't respond to my questions. So I just offer up one question, and it's a recurring question on Skeptico, and that is, what's going on here? How have we devolved into a scientific and academic system that props up such nonsense? Again, the real scary thing about Dr. Churchland is her opinion is the status quo majority opinion. It's nonsensical, it's indefensible, but it's the majority opinion. And don't question it. So again, the question is a fresh look at what's going on here. How can this be? What's wrong with the system This isn't an isolated situation. This is systemic. This isn't about philosophy or neurophilosophy, whatever that means. This is about science. This is about the culture war debate over who we are, what we are, where we came from. That's what this is about, and that's why this silliness is put forth in the way that it is, because institutional science is more afraid of whatever else might come out of the data than they are of these old, tired, worn-out, nonsensical ideas. Well, there, I've answered the question. But I still hope you'll answer it as well. And, of course, the place to do that is at the Skeptico website at skeptiko.com. There you can leave a comment right there in the show notes, jump on over to the forum and join the conversation there, or connect with me via Facebook or email. So I have a number of interesting ideas for shows coming up. I don't have any shows in the hopper. I've kind of cleaned up my backlog from the holidays, so I'm ready to move on to some new topics, and I'm not exactly sure where I'm going to go. So I'm going to have to dig through some of those many great suggestions that you've sent and see if I can find something there or see if something else pops up. I do hope you'll stay with me for all of that. I greatly, greatly appreciate your support of the show, and your willingness to share the show with other like-minded people. That's going to do it for this episode. Do take care, and bye for now. 